Today we are diving into the fascinating world of risk management. We are going to calculate value at risk in Python based on the Monte Carlo method. So we're going to be performing about 10,000 simulations in less than a second. So let's jump right into it. In order to calculate value at risk in Python, we're going to have to import the necessary libraries. I'm using six of them in this example all listed here. If you don't have any of these or one of them, uh, installed on your computer, you're going to have to go into the command prompt and type pip install the library name that is pip install and then for example you would put numpy. So let's go ahead and run that and now we've got all six of our necessary libraries imported. Now what we're going to be doing here is setting a time range for a certain number of years to help us in our analysis. We're going to be pulling data from Yahoo Finance on stocks for that period of time. Just to start off with, I'm going to start with uh, 15 years. So we'll set a variable called uh, years equal to 15. And then we're going to have to declare an end date based on today. And I can use that date time library that we declared up here as DT, um, date time as DT right here. And then we'll call a function from that library date time dot now, which gives us today's date. And then we want to create a start date that's based on um, 15 years earlier. So we'll use end date and then we'll use another date time function. So we'll subtract um, DT dot time delta, which gives us a certain number of days. And so we'll set days equal to 365 days in a year multiplied by the number of years that we declared above. And let's run that. So we'll now have a date of today here and a date 15 years ago here. Let's create a list of tickers and we'll just call it tickers. And I'm going to start off with five as an example. And we got to use the square brackets to create that list. The first one, let's use SPY, which is the uh, largest S&P 500 ETF. Then next we'll use BND, which is the largest bond market ETF. Next we'll use GLD, which is the largest commodity based ETF, which tracks the price of gold. And then we'll use QQQ, which is the largest NASDAQ ETF, and then VTI, which is Vanguard's uh, all-world stock index. And let's run that. Okay, perfect. So now for each of these tickers, what we're going to do is download the daily adjusted close prices for all of them. And the reason we're using adjusted close prices rather than the normal close prices is because adjusted close prices count for dividends and stock splits. And our analysis will be more accurate if we incorporate those. So what we're going to be doing first is just creating an empty data frame called adjusted close DF. And we're going to set it equal to the pandas, so PD dot data frame. So we're declaring this data frame, but we haven't put anything in it yet. Now we're going to create a for loop to go through this whole list of each of these tickers. And we're going to grab the adjusted close prices for um, each date for all the tickers in that range. So here's our for loop. For each ticker in tickers, we're going to get the data from Yahoo Finance and we're going to download that data based on that ticker symbol and then the start date and the end date that we declared above. And then once we have all the data, we're just going to parse out the adjusted close value because that's all we need. Let's just print out um, the adjusted close DF just so that you guys can see for yourselves what it looks like. And let's run that. It should take a couple seconds because it's a bit of data to download. Okay, so we downloaded all five. And now starting from here is the data frame. So we just have each date for the last 15 years. And we've got the adjusted close price for every single one of these five ETFs for each date. Now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the daily log returns and we're going to drop any NAs. So what I mean by daily log returns is if you think of a simple return, it would just be taking one day's price and divide it by the previous day's price and subtract one. That would give you the percentage change. But then if you take the log of that, it actually makes our lives easier on later on in the calculation because um, the log returns are additive. And if we do it on an annualized basis, log returns are um, easier to work with. So let's get the log returns and we'll put them in a variable called log returns and we'll set it equal to numpy or np.log. And then we're going to take adjusted close 
df and we're going to divide it by adjusted close df dot shift one and so what this shift one is doing is it's basically saying like let's say for example on this date the uh, april 29th of 2008 if we wanted to find the uh change in price or the percentage return we take this value we'll shift up one row so we'll divide by the row shifted up one above it right and then we're taking the log of that so that gives us our daily returns and what we need to do now is actually drop any na's so drop any na values and the reason we do that is because the first row wouldn't actually have anything to divide by so we need to get rid of any possible NAs because it can screw up the analysis later on. And then I'll also just go ahead and print this uh, log returns data frame so that you guys can see uh, what it looks like. So let's print that. And so we can see that for every single day for the entire time range, we have the percentage change in each of these ETFs price. Next, we're going to create a function that will help us calculate our portfolio's expected return. And so we'll just define this as a function called expected return. And we're going to pass in two variables. We're going to first pass in weights, which will We'll declare this later on, but it's just going to be the weight of each uh, ETF or ticker in our portfolio. And then we're also going to pass in the log returns data frame that uh, we calculated above. So this is just the daily returns of each of the securities. And then with those, we're going to return. We're going to return um, the sum of the weighted average of all the returns. So we'll do np.sum and then we're going to take the mean of log returns. And so how you can think about this is say, for example, for SPY here, we're just gonna take the mean of all, or the average of all of its returns to come out with an average return, uh, average daily return over the last 15 years. And then we're gonna multiply it by its own weight. And then we're gonna do that for all of them and so we're going to get a weighted average, so an average of each one multiplied by its own weight, and then we're going to sum all of those to get a weighted average. And an important thing to note here is that we're using what might be a bad assumption for expected returns. See, we're assuming that future returns are based on past returns, which is not a reliable assumption. So if you wanted to make this more accurate, what you would have to do is come up with your own expected returns or pay for an equity research firm's expected returns for each of the securities you're looking at and then run this analysis rather than using the historical returns to base the um, future returns on. Just, just to clarify. So now we're gonna create a function that we'll use to calculate the portfolio standard deviation. So let's define that as standard deviation. So we're passing in two parameters to the standard deviation function. We're passing in the weights, just like we did with the expected return. And then we're going to pass in something we'll define later on, which is the covariance matrix. And so a covariance matrix takes into account the covariances and correlations of every single um, stock within the portfolio and their correlations with each other one. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And then we're calculating variance based on a transposition, so transposed weights. So we're taking, let's say we had this uh, weights array and then we're gonna transpose it and then we're multiplying it by the covariance matrix. And then once again, we're going to multiply by the original weights array. And so this is just the standard way that you calculate um, variance, which I know is convoluted, but the math checks out. And then we're going to return the square root of the variance because remember that standard deviation is always the square root of the variance. And now here's where we'll actually create the covariance matrix for all the securities, uh, the, the, the covariance matrix that I was mentioning in the standard deviation calculation. And this is really easy. It's just a quick line of code. We'll call it cove matrix and we'll set it equal to log returns dot uh, cove and it's nice because um, Python just has an inbuilt Excel function to create that and if you want to see what it looks like I'll just print it out for you so yeah let's print that and so all it's doing is it's just taking the covariance of each element or security within this portfolio and finding the covariance with the other one. So for example, this right here would represent the covariance uh, between SPY and BND. 
And then if we look over here, it's the same number as this number because this is also the covariance between B and D and SPY. And then it goes for just all five combinations, or I guess I should say all 20-ish combinations. Okay, now let's create an equally weighted portfolio and find the total portfolio expected return in standard deviation. So I'm gonna say our portfolio we're using, and this example has a value of $1 million. So I'm just gonna hard code that in there. And now we're gonna have to equally weight the portfolio. So what I mean by that is since we have five securities, we're just gonna say there's $200,000 weighted into each security, so 20% each. So here we're using the NumPy library to create an array that has uh, five different elements within it and each one of them is equal to one divided by the length of tickers and the length of tickers is five so one divided by five so 20 percent each and now we're going to calculate our portfolio expected return and we're just going to set that equal to and we're just going to grab this right here from the function so we're calling that function and we're passing in weights and log returns and then we're going to do the same thing with portfolio uh, standard deviation so we'll call that portfolio standard dev and we'll set it just equal to the uh, we're calling the standard deviation function and we're passing in weights and the covariance matrix let's run that perfect so now we're going to create a function that gives a random z-score based on a normal distribution and the reason we're going to do that is because we're going to eventually do 10,000 uh, simulations for this code so each one is going to generate a random z-score based on a normal distribution so most of the z-scores will be more towards the center of that bell curve and then a lower and lower number will be out into the tails so this is actually pretty easy so we'll just define this function as random z-score and then we're going to make it return uh, numpy so np dot random dot normal and we're just going to grab a value that's randomly um between zero and one so that'll give us random z-scores every time and we'll run that and now we're going to create a function to calculate scenario gain and loss so what we're doing here first is we're just setting the days equal to five and so when you calculate var it's always based on a certain time period, so a certain number of days, for example, and a certain confidence interval. So we're declaring one of those two here. So what we're gonna be saying is, if in the next five days, and if let's say we set our confidence interval to 95%, at the 95% confidence interval, so all the way out in the left tail of that bell curve, what is the basically the fifth percentile worst case scenario over a five day period of money that I could lose on this portfolio. And so we're, we're gonna get all our scenarios, gains and losses. So we're passing into this function, the portfolio value, the portfolio standard deviation, the Z score that we generated randomly here, and then the number of days which we declared here. And so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna return portfolio value times portfolio expected return times days. So this component of this formula gives us what would be our typical expected return over that number of days. So this would say, this is a million dollars, I normally expect to return 0.05% uh, in a day, and there's five days, so that gives me how much cash I'd expect to have at the end of five days in returns. And then this element here, we do plus portfolio value times standard portfolio standard deviation times z-score times the square root of days. And so what this is doing is this is adding this volatile element. So it's going to be adding either negative or positive numbers based on whether these Z scores here are negative or positive. And so that's going to capture that variance element based on the portfolio's risk or standard deviation. And then now we're going to take that and we're going to run 10,000 simulations. So we'll say simulation. Uh, we're going to e set that equal to 10,000. And then we'll create an empty array. We'll call it scenario return. And we're going to just create uh, square brackets that are empty. And basically, when we run 10,000 simulations calling this function, we're going to be passing uh, all those 10,000 results into this empty array. And so we're going to do that with a for loop. 
so so far i've created a for loop that's just going to say for i in the range of simulation so it's just going to run ten thousand times we're going to generate a random z score every single time and now what we're doing here is we're going to append into this scenario return list the value of when we call the scenario gain loss function here and we pass in all the parameters that it requires that we pass in and we're going to do this 10,000 times and store all the results so let's run that perfect and now we're going to specify a confidence interval so like I mentioned before there's always a certain number of days and a certain confidence interval and the higher we set our confidence interval the greater our value at risk will be because we'll move further out into the tail of the distribution. So let's just start off with a 95% confidence interval and then let's specify a new variable called var. And we'll set that equal to negative, so numpy.percentile. And we're going to pass in this uh, variable here, scenario return. And then we're going to take 100 times 1 minus the confidence interval. And so the reason we do that is because we need to get the significance level. And the significance level is just 1 minus the confidence interval. So if our confidence interval is essentially 95%, then our significance level is 5%. So let's run this now. Oh, sorry, I got to make this a negative here. And let's run that. Okay, range is fine, but let's print it. Let's just see what our value at risk is. So I'm going to say var equals, or print var. And so this tells us our value at risk is 29,749 for a five-day period at a 95% confidence interval. And I want to show you the logic of what I was saying before. So if I increase our confidence interval, we should see an increase in the VAR. So let's change it to 99% and then let's run that. See, now our VAR increased to 42% from uh, what it, 29, or thousand, sorry, it's at 42,000. It used to be at 29,000. And then if we increase our number of days, so let's say instead of looking at five days, we look at 20 days. This should further increase the VAR as well because it, we have a greater potential for more losses over a larger uh, time frame. So let's run that. Now it's 82,000 rather than what it was before, which is 42,000. So I'll just change this back to 0.95. And then let's run it one more time. And then let's plot the results of all 10,000 scenarios so we can make some sense out of this. So here's our distribution. So this is a plot of all the potential gains and losses at the 95% confidence level over a 20 day period. And we can see that at the 95th percent confidence level, our VAR falls right here on this part of the tail of the distribution. But if we change this and we set it equal to um, 0.99, so let's set it there. And then we rerun this. Let me uh, run the simulations one more time. So now if we rerun this, this VAR moves further out into the tail. So now that's at the 99th percentile rather than the 95th percentile. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, please click like and subscribe and comment if you enjoyed. And if you need help on a freelance project or any financial modeling projects, feel free to reach out to me using the link in the description. Thanks for watching.